Welcome to the Politics of Everything. I'm Amber Danes, your host and podcast producer. This is a half hour of power, a podcast dropping every week where I unpack the politics of everything, from money to motherhood, nutrition to narcissism, startups to secularism, the environment, equality, and much, much more. Our guests are seasoned in the field or topic of their choice, even if you've not heard of them yet. This is a non-partisan show. So while I love exploring varied views and get a buzz from a healthy debate of ideas, this is not a purely blue, white, green program. Please subscribe, tune in and enjoy the politics of everything. A personal brand is widely recognised as the perception or impression of an individual based on their experience, expertise, competencies, actions or achievements within a community, industry or the marketplace at large. Personal brands may be deliberately modified to reinvent a public person. So when did this become the norm and do us everyday humans really have a personal brand or do we need to create constantly to be able to be relevant and visible in this modern world, particularly with social media? I wonder if having a personal brand makes any difference in an already hectic, noisy online space where platforms like TikTok and Instagram are flooded with content that can at times seem a bit self-indulgent. Well, to find out more, I'm speaking to someone who works extensively in this personal brand space. Catherine Porrett is known around the world as the leading iconic strategist to personal brands. She works privately with those destined for greatness to help them take the expertise and turn it into their own iconic empire. Following the successful sale of her multi-million dollar company, e-commerce company, she established Icons Incorporated to represent the world's elite personal brands with branding, representation services, commercialization strategies, big deal PR, and speaking. And so very much excited to chat to you a little bit now, Catherine, about the politics of personal brand. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Amber. I am a big fan of this podcast and I'm really excited to dig in and have a chat with you today. Podcasting remotely can be challenging, but it doesn't have to be. Since 2017, I have relied on Zencaster's all-in-one web-based solution to make the process quick and painless, the way podcasting should be. If you know me, I'm pretty obsessed with quality guests, quality content, and quality sound, and that's what Zencaster allows me to do. Not to mention, it's really easy to use, even for my guests that aren't particularly tech-savvy. There's nothing to download, they just click on the link and we start recording. Zencaster is all about making your podcasting experience easy and with everything from local recording to automatic post-production all in the one tool, you don't have to leave your browser to get each episode done. I want you to have the same great experience that I do for all my podcasts and content needs. So I have a special offer for you. If you go to zen.ai forward slash politics of everything and enter this promo code, you'll get 30% off in your first three months when you sign up to Zencaster Pro. That's Z. E N dot A I uh, politics of everything. It's now time to share your story. Excellent. So if you could cast your mind to what you wanted to be when you grew up, I imagine personal branding wasn't even a thing, perhaps. So did you remember what you wanted to be and how did that eventuate? Did you sort of kind of follow a particular career path? Yeah, I love this question because although personal brands weren't really a defined thing at the time. I'm now in my mid forties. When I cast my mind back to what I wanted to be when I grew up, it was always about broadcast journalism. So I grew up in a small town and was very much enamored with, you know, television, magazines. That was the the time of media really flourishing. And there was lots of amazing magazines around and lots of really interesting conversational media that was turning up. And so I really wanted to get into broadcast journalism or writing. That was always, communications was, was always, always my thing. And when I think about the trajectory now with where I've ended up, it really was all about building a personal brand and then leveraging that. Though I studied journalism at university, I never actually practiced for one day, but I did get into marketing very quickly and really loved that sort of thrill of the chase and really being able to help develop the growth. And I'm very competitive and very ambitious. So marketing suited me really well. And that's really the the transition that I made from where I really wanted to be as a little girl to where I am today. It, it kind of makes sense. You can pull the thread 
Yeah, you can look back and join the dots. So where did having and managing your own personal brand become the norm? I mean, I barely remember the tipping point. I mean, we talk about, I guess, modern day examples in the business world, I think of someone like a Simon Sinek or a Brene Brown, or if you want to talk about celebrity like the Kardashians, which have been around for 20 years. And I'm of a similar vintage to you, but I don't remember exactly when that became normal. I mean, even if I cast my mind back to the 80s and 90s, um, big basketball fans. So, you know, Michael Jordan, the Nikes, the Gatorade ads, I want to be like Mike. I mean, that was probably my first awareness of a personal brand within a brand. But do you have any idea from your perspective, even academically, when when this kind of evolved? I am 100% not from the academic area of Um, of anything really. From my end, it's all been about sort of a social study and um, professional study through my career. I remember really clearly as I was growing up, really following journalists and really loving, you know, particular brands of, of journalists and media personalities that I really aspired to, you know, to be like, or to, you know, to their career trajectory, the influence that they had. People like Mia Friedman, who now has a massive personal brand and Lisa Wilkinson were around and and very much had a lot of influence when I was, uh, you know, in my late teens and 20s, as well as a lot of business brands. I've got a a real keen interest in business strategy. And so people like Anita Roddick were really of interest to me. So I think they've always been there. We just didn't have this clear definition, nor did they have the level of influence in the same way that they do now that we've got such a, a heightened use of of the digital medium. So social media just allows us to really democratise that influence at a, a huge mainstream rate. Does a personal brand differ from your company brand if you are, for example, Elon Musk, who's the founder of Tesla, but he's also got a very strong personal brand as he kind of evolves his own sort of empire, if you like. And I guess from your professional point of view, how do you compartmentalise those or you don't need to? I just don't think that they differ now. So I remember very distinctly in the early part of my career, I was in my 20s and I was working with a peak body or an association and we represented the IT industry in Australia. I did their marketing and uh, membership management. And I remember on the board were some very significant CEOs from very significant multinational companies, as well as some Australian companies. And I sat down with someone who is extremely well known in the marketplace now with his personal brand. And this was 20 odd years ago. I remember having breakfast with him and having quite a heated argument about whether to leverage the personal brands of the CEOs on the board to help elevate the IT industries, you know, the, the, the way that it was perceived and the way that it was attracting IT employees at the time. And he was strongly of the opinion that we shouldn't leverage personal brands for that. The CEO brands should be disassociated with the, with the, the companies, et cetera, that, you know, that just, it, put them into a corner. What's really interesting, I won't I won't give away who it is, but he's now the CEO of a very significant Australian technology company and his personal brand is everywhere, everywhere. He's a speaker, Ironically. he's an author, he's, yeah. <laughs> and I, I just wish I could go back to that moment in time and say, hey, let's replay that conversation. But I think that just goes to show in my mind that you just can't disassociate them. You can't disassociate um, Elon Musk from Tesla. You can't disassociate, you know, the whoever the CEO is at the time of Apple with Apple, a, a brand. And from a CEO's perspective, from the the corporate's perspective, this is a really interesting moment in time as well because that means that if you have a thousand employees, really, you don't just have a thousand employees. You've got a thousand personal brands to try and. You could leverage them. You could, you know, leverage them as part of your culture, as part of your marketing mix, as part of your culture building and team building, or you could choose to, you know, really not leverage that and that could put you in a a real hole with your brand as well. So I just see them as one and the same and I think the companies that don't recognise that are really being left behind. It's interesting you say that. And I suppose the example with someone like an Elon Musk, you know, he's a founder as well as the head of an organization. So, you know, I'm thinking something like a 
big banks, for example. I work in a lot in corporate communications. And of course, CEOs change after a number of years and yeah, the legacy might stay a little bit, but then there's a new CEO that comes in and might change it. So do you think it matters if you're, where you are where you sit in the organisation? If you're not the founder, but you're the CEO that's kind of come in for a period of time and then you leave, do you take the personal brand with you or can you reinvent it when you are, for example, CEO somewhere else? Yeah, I'm not a big fan of the reinvention of a personal brand. I'm a massive fan of authenticity. I've I've watched people like Paris Hilton, for example, you know, create a personal brand, which I'm a really strong advocate against because now she's been pushed in a corner and there's been plenty of interviews with her where she says, I, I hate being associated with this brand of you know, the the dumb blonde. I just hate this. And I'm like, well, if you're not that, why did you ever associate yourself with this? This idea of having an alter ego or yeah. not being authentic in who you are, I think has, has got some real problems with it for that exact reason that you're talking about. And I think also just that example with Paris Hilton, like as you age, I mean, that becomes a little bit tired, if you know what I mean. I mean, I don't want to be ageist about it, but what what's good at 20 is not necessarily great at 40. Right. And the market will love you. The, the market looks to you to grow, particularly if you are iconic. They're not looking to you to be static. So I'm not saying while well, you're being authentic, you must always be this one generic prototype. What I am saying, though, is be you, be the best version of you. Yes, you can put polish on that and all of those things, but when it comes to transitioning from company to company or from offer to offer or from whatever it is that you're doing, career to career, then it just won't matter. You take that with you. It's what the the audience is expecting of you and they will follow you for that reason. Absolutely. So what are the best ways to amplify our own personal brands? Of course, social media plays a big part and we can curate content to sort of, I guess, project an image. But is that the sole way to do it? There's got to be some, I guess, offline ways in which our personal brand is going to really resonate and perhaps seem more authentic than it can through a filter. Absolutely. It's one of my favourite topics to talk about. I think a lot of people get confused with the idea of, you know, amplification or they they start with amplification. How do I get my personal brand out there? And I have all of my clients, regardless of how well known they are and how much authority they have in the market, I have them start with this real audit of who they are and looking inward because, you know, if you're a student of marketing or politics or psychology or almost any anything really, we're, we're taught to look to our audience and we're taught to, taught to look to the people we trust and taught to look to our market for the answers first. I think that's got real problems for you as a personal brand in the future for the same reason that I was just talking about with Paris Hilton. Because if you look to your audience for the answer of who am I and where should I, you know, how should I brand myself and what should I be turning up like and what is my positioning going to look like, then that's not going to be authentically you. So there's an unstripping of all that you know, not looking to your competition, not looking to your market for answers, but instead this sort of inward looking work that I get all of my clients to do. It could take five minutes or it could take five months. It really just depends on where you are and how, how, what your mindset is like, how much stripping away we need to do. Once we're really clear on who you are and what you really stand for, I literally get my clients to write their manifesto So what is this revolution that they're here to really take charge of? From there, Amber, it becomes usually very clear, crystal clear about what the messaging and the positioning and what the personal brand stands for and how we actually produce that revolution, get that into action. And for a lot of my clients, that doesn't look like the traditional, you know, just pop you on social media and get you, you know, saying all of these things or working with brand alignment strategies like the Kardashians would do. What it more so looks like is, you know, my clients have got this big revolution. They're usually wanting to create a legacy that lasts well beyond, well beyond, you know, this or the next lifetime. This is something they want to shift a paradigm. And so it's really more about a very clear revolutionary blueprint that we want to put together in a master plan. And that could be leveraging media, it could be social media, it could be, you know, sitting on particular boards. You know, some really interesting, if you analyse 
some of the bigger personal brands around at the moment, people like Elon Musk or Prince Harry even, the way that they're leveraging their personal brand isn't just the social is just a platform. Yeah, There are so many other ways that they're influencing and that they're producing their revolution. And it's it's really, really fascinating to watch. And if you're interested in taking your personal brand and shifting a paradigm or changing the world in some way, shape or form, then there's some really key lessons from people like those two extraordinary men that you could learn and put into your own master plan. I think it's great when things are going well, but obviously um, there are times a personal brand can become toxic or it's kind of gone down a path and an association which the individual or the organisation is not so happy with. So how do you help clients navigate that process when they're affected by a scandal or a change of status? Because I'm even thinking of Prince Harry, he's polarising. You know, not everyone loves him maybe the way they might have five years ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's interesting. I We don't, we've got a PR company as part of our agency and we've never once had to do crisis management in the traditional sense because a lot of my clients are actually looking to agitate. That's really what they're looking to do is create some type of paradigm shift or change in the world. And so we're actually looking for that. We're not... We're not looking to go out there and, you know, create controversy for the sake of it, but that, in fact, being polarising is often incredibly important if you want to change the world. And so someone like Prince Harry, my bet is, though I don't represent him nor know him personally and and have never spoken to him, but my bet is that he he and his representatives are very happy that he's polarising very happy that there's a portion of the market that aren't happy with him and there's, he's very happy with a, the portion of the market that's growing that are coming on this ride with him as he's shifting things and challenging the norms and really changing the way that the world views the monarchy and influence through his sovereignty and all sorts of things that he stands for and and it's giving him a platform to then talk about the things that matter to him most like mental health etc so I honestly, I don't, in my mind, there's not a bad, you know, it's not a bad use of controversy or opinion as long as it's handled in the right way. I haven't come across a client yet where we've had to do any sort of traditional crisis management work. Yeah, that's interesting. I guess in my every my day job, if you like, that's kind of what I do. So a yes. crisis and reputational rebuild. And sometimes it's through no fault of that individual's own, you know what I mean? If a company's a, you know, sinking and they're only one cog in the wheel, it's easy to lay blame. But often it's it's just about the trajectory and, uh, you know, I guess navigating the fact that things happen to people and situations yeah. happen and you can't control everything, I think, is is the main thing. Even with social media, you know, you think you can, but everyone is now a journalist because we've all got cameras on our phone and video on our phone. So, you know, if you have a bad day and you slip up and you so forth, it's very different to it was perhaps in the 80s where everything wasn't documented in the same way. I, look, I totally agree with you. And and to be honest, I haven't had a client, you know, be cancelled or have any of those. I can imagine very dramatic circumstances having looked at a lot of you know, people who've said things that were controversial and ended them in hot water, for example, on reality TV shows. And we tend to remember that more than the 20 other great things they've said. You know, there's just something in the human psyche. Right. And I think having support people around you like me and like you for those brands would help them see the wood for the trees. I think that's, you know, that's really important to have people around you who can help you navigate those circumstances and take you away from the negativity and help you to spin it in a way that's going to help you leverage that to to help you achieve the, the bigger picture and the, the bigger goal. Do everyday folks um, like us, I guess, have a personal brand they may not be aware of? Because I think a lot of people struggle with this idea and you've mentioned it earlier on our conversation that, you know, you might have a thousand employees and each of them have a personal brand. They may not even think of themselves like that, particularly if they're not in you're wearing communications and marketing and PR and that world. But if you're kind of, you know, behind the scenes in a back more back office role or it's not your personality to kind of even post anything online, how do you actually identify that brand and our brand personality and I guess what our value proposition is if we are just newbies to all of this? Yeah, so I think everyone does have a personal brand. There's no question that we do. There's a way that we're perceived. There's a way that we show up. We've got a personality 
type. We've got certain opinions on things. We've got goals. We've got, you know, a certain way that we show up, our aesthetic profile, all of those things all come together to create this very unique thing that we now call a personal brand. Now, how you leverage that is, of course, up to you. But I would say that for the vast majority of people who want to have a professional career, whether that be entrepreneurship, you know, founding a company, being the CEO of a company, being the C-suite or an executive or even an employee, if you really want to go the distance now, I think you need to take that really seriously. And a lot of HR departments are thinking this way now. The very forward thinking ones are where they're they're looking at LinkedIn profiles of all of their employees and they're looking at investing in things like professional headshots and the way that people are showing up on social media and giving them training on, you know, positioning themselves and what to say and what not to say. I think that's a good thing. I really do. I think there you are, you know, each of us have an opportunity to leverage that throughout our career. You can use it in any way that you want to, but I think these more forward thinking companies are looking at that's leverage. That is, we can create this company full of these unique personal brands, but if we have them all heading in the same direction, you know, with their own opinions and they can be, in, you know, entrepreneurs and all sorts of things within the the context of the bigger picture, I think, I think there's, you can take a brand on a really interesting trajectory if you do that. So I think if you're not To answer your question more definitively, I think if you're interested in taking your career somewhere or you're interested in founding a company or being an author or a speaker or doing any of those things, I think you must take this seriously and you must get really clear on who you are and what you stand for and do it authentically, as we both said. But if if not, then of course, you know, that's your choice. I'm not suggesting that, you know, 7 billion people in the world need to take this seriously, but there's a portion of the market that absolutely should and can. Who've been your greatest mentors? And there are one or two perhaps that you can talk about that have made a big impact in your life and career and explain a little bit more about them. I've had so many. I take mentorship incredibly seriously. And I, I think back to many times in my career where I've been really challenged and that they've been the moments where I've gone, you know what, I wasn't necessarily seeking a mentor out of this, but this is a moment that's career defining personality defining. I can either, you know, cower on the floor at this moment in time where I've, you know, either made a mistake or um, taken things in the wrong direction, or I can learn from what this person is saying to me and I can really move myself forward. I remember a university professor who I studied with was one of those people. He was an extraordinary defence journalist and he really challenged me. He kept telling me that my writing wasn't up to standard. He had this expectation of me that I was going to be so much better than the standard of work that I kept handing into him. And it was ridiculously frustrating for me at the time, but I worked my way through it and he got the best out of me. And I absolutely 100% to this day, I will write things and I will say he would have been so proud of that. He really pushed me to be such so much more professional in my communication and writing style. There's so many other really great mentors that I've had over the years, but one that really stands the test of time is I have an uncle who had quite a number of companies that he started and they became multi-million dollar companies and then he lost a number of them. So he had a really wild ride when I was growing up. My dad was very steady as a business owner and wasn't chasing, you know, the millions and um, he was looking for that sort of steadiness, whereas my uncle was, he was crazy and really had a, a massive appetite for risk and competition. I'm very much like him and to this day I love talking about business with him and I know he loves talking about it with me. He's now not at the point where he has a business anymore, but he really gets excited when we sit down and have a long chat about what's been going on in my business and what I'm doing. So just having someone who's sort of similar, particularly when you've got a very unique personality type, I know there's not very many people who like that, who have a a high appetite for risk and are uber competitive and like founding companies. So when you find a good mentor who 
who've done what you aspire to do, I say hold on to them. Absolutely. <laughs> they're great. And even better if you're related to them because yes. they're on tap. <laughs> Absolutely. So true. So, Catherine, if we spoke again in a year, what would be the number one thing you have hoped to have changed in your business or career and why? I don't really want to change a lot. At this stage, I was very lucky that I had a very large e-commerce business that I sold and then started this company from a very privileged position of I really want to pick and choose the very best personal brands in the world and I want to help them to elevate to the levels that I know they can get to but they can't do it on their own. I'm having the best time. I have the most creative team in the world. I have the most extraordinary clients who are literally changing the world and shifting social norms and and impacting at levels that I just, it blows my mind. Every day I wake up and I think, man, I am so lucky. So I just want more and more and more of the same. And I really, really want to continue to challenge myself by bringing in more super gifted, genius level, intelligent clients where I've got to really push myself to learn a lot about what they're doing and help them to to really change the world in the way that they want to. So what would be your final takeaway message for all of us on the politics of personal branding? I think if you've got a, a real sense of knowing that you want to shift things, you want to impact, you want to change the world, uh, for me, the big interesting moment that we have right now is that you can do that through your personal brand and it doesn't necessarily need to be through politics anymore. I think a lot of us used to think that you needed to get on stage or you needed to be in politics in order to change the world. What I'm seeing now, if you look at the people who are literally making change, it's people. Yeah, it's much more grassroots and authentic, I think, than ever. Exactly. And people like Elon Musk, as someone you brought up before, is incredibly interesting to me as well. These are the people who are changing the world. There is the grassroots stuff going on and the people who really have this sort of omnipotent power now are the ones who actually have a business background. So I would say this is a really interesting moment in time and it's an interesting moment in politics. It's an interesting moment for personal brands and the world and I'm just I'm here for the ride and I'm really excited to be a part of it. Thank you so much for your time today. I think all of us have learned a little bit more about what personal branding involves and what it doesn't. And if you do want to connect further with Catherine, of course, there'll be some details on our show notes. Until next time, take care. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks so much for listening today. If you've enjoyed the politics of everything, I thrive on your feedback. So please add a short review and share the podcast with your network through Apple, Spotify and all the usual suspects. I'm always on the hunt for new and diverse guests. So if you or someone you know has a fresh idea you're busting to get out there, please email me at amber at amberdanes.com and my crew will get back to you very soon.